Amen. Well, good morning. We are, I'm going to just jump right into it. We are finishing up this series on the seven churches in Revelation. And the last church is a church in the, in the city known as Laodicea. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit real quick about just what you might, have, might expect if you were to go back in time uh, in the Wayback Machine and, and go visit Laodicea. You see, Laodicea was famous for producing black wool. I don't know why that's a big deal, but it was. Just trust me. And uh, if, with that black wool, they would create, they would, they would weave, they would make all of this expensive clothing, very fine clothing. So like if you were to go to a market in Laodicea, it was like the Greco-Roman equivalent of the finest boutiques of New York, London, Paris, which I have no idea about because I get my clothes from outlet malls and Marshalls and Goodwill. So, because that's just a personal preference. I will not pay more than 20 bucks for a shirt. Just ask Jennifer, it's true. So, what else would you find in Laodicea? Well, they were famous also because they had a medical school. They had a medical school, in fact, that, that was specialized in eyes and ears. This morning, at about 2.30, I wish I had this medical school because, you see, what happened was our cat, Pumpkin, started meowing. And she does this every morning at like 6 a.m. usually to wake us up. She's like a rooster. Except for this morning, she decided to do it at 2.30 a.m. And I'm like, come on, Satan. Is this the best you got? But she, she literally was like Satan incarnate this morning because she just kept meowing and meowing and meowing. And then I would get up to try to get her and put her in the garage, and she would go under the bed. So finally, she gets up on the bed, and I'm like, this is my chance. I grab her. She scratches me on the ear. Like, my ear's bleeding at 2.30 in the morning. And I'm like, I need, I need the medical guys from Laodicea to come help me, because that's what they specialized in. They actually, for eyes, they created this eye salve. I guess it was revolutionary at the time. If you had an eye irritation or if you needed, like, LASIK or something, you just put it on your eyes, and you fi fixed it. It's great. So, so you got in this town, you got all these doctors and wealthy merchants and they're all very wealthy, and the church was no different. The church in Laodicea was full of wealthy people, which is fine, except for what Jesus is coming to tell this church here is that their wealth has caused tons of problems. And we're going to look at what those problems are. In fact, what we're going to see is that this church only receives a warning from Jesus. This is the only letter where there's no praise. There is only warning. And so today... What I'm inviting us to do is to be honest with ourselves. We, we always want to be honest with ourselves, but today we, we have to look deeply at our hearts and question whether or not this warning applies to us as well, and this is potentially a hard thing to hear. So let's start out, we'll look at the text from Re Revelation 3, just verses 14 through 16 to begin. He says, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot, or sorry, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The first thing we're going to look at here is that the church is meant, it's, it's meant to be God's instrument to refresh and revive, but the Laodiceans were apathetic and indifferent. So what is he talking about here when he starts talking hot and cold and lukewarm? What is that all about? Well, um, this is something, if you've, if you've been around the church for a while, if you've read the Bible enough, you probably have heard something about this, okay? Uh, and this refers to water, actually. And there are really uh, there are two main interpretations of how you might look at this text. So I, I want to look at this chart to kind of reflect what, what both of these interpretations are. And, and neither one is necessarily um, bad. It's just two different ways of looking at it. So the first one, which is actually a little more common, is that this is about our passion for Jesus or, or our feelings for Jesus. How do you feel about him? Do you feel on fire for him? That's, in, in this interpretation, that is most desirable. The second option is, are you cold for him? 
Do you feel nothing for him? Are you like, in fact, maybe you're opposed to him. In this interpretation, that's actually the second best option. Because the worst option, the worst thing, the thing you absolutely do not want to be is lukewarm. You do not want to be indifferent and apathetic to Jesus. You don't want to know about him, know the gospel, know the Bible, and to just be like, eh, don't really care. That's the worst. So that's, that's interpretation one. Interpretation two is that this is not necessarily about our feelings for Jesus as much as it is about our good works or, our, or our, just our works for Jesus. Like, what is our, what is our life display about how we are when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. So in this interpretation, hot and cold are actually both good. It's not one is good and one is bad. It's they're both good. They are useful for Jesus. And we're going to talk about why that is in just a second. And then lukewarm, it's, it's similar. You're indifferent, you're apathetic, you just don't care. Or at least your life portrays an image that you don't care. So let's talk about why I, I actually prefer interpretation too. And here's the reason why. A guy named Michael Gorman uh, explains it this way. He says, both of these hot and cold water are pleasing and beneficial, while lukewarm water is precisely the opposite, disgusting to the taste and not salutary. So let's look at a map. There is Laodicea down in the, in the bottom right corner. And around it are these two cities, Hierapolis and Colossae, okay? So Hierapolis was six miles away, and it was famous for hot springs. You could go take a dip in a hot spring in Hierapolis, and you'd feel like you're in a hot tub. It was medicinal. It was healing. It brought revival to your body, especially if you were sore or achy. It would feel so good, okay? So that's the hot. The cold comes from Colossae, 11 miles away. You, you had this mountain stream that flowed down into the city, and that's where they got their drinking water. It was cold. It was refreshing. It was like Zephyr Hills just coming out of the mountains. It was, it was amazing. Okay, so if you're hot, you're parched, you got some high-quality H2O, as Bobby Boucher would say. So those are the two different water references. What about, what about Laodicea? Well, they got their drinking water from the hot springs, in Hierapolis, six miles away. It came from an aqueduct. And by the time it got from Hierapolis to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. It was gross. You ever get some, like, tepid bath water in your mouth? Imagine if that was your drinking water, and that's the only thing you had. And not only, not only that, but apparently... This water had all this calcium carbonate in it, which if you're like a chemist, you might know what that means, but I don't. But I do know, supposedly it made you sick. So you're drinking water, the only thing you got makes you sick all the time. A lot of sick people in Laodicea, apparently. So when Jesus says, when Jesus says, Laodicea, you are lukewarm, you make me sick. Wow. Wow. That's tough, but, but, but notice what he says. He says, at first he says, I know your works. And then he says, that's what makes me sick. It's not necessarily, and so that's why I say, I go with number interpretation two, because he's not necessarily talking about their feelings for him. He's saying, I know that your works, that's what makes me want to spit you out of my mouth. So let's talk about that. What about our works? 2 Timothy 2.21 says this. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So if, if we know the gospel, if we, have, if we believe what the Bible says about Jesus is true, if we believe that he has come in the flesh, the Son of God incarnate, lived a perfect life, gave up his life on the cross, suffered much, was forsaken by the Father on the cross, and did that as a sacrifice for you and me so that we could not have to suffer the wrath of God, but instead be free and have eternal life. If that is true, then, then what happens is the Holy Spirit changes our hearts so that we're not the same anymore. Our lives are changed. We, we now live our lives not for ourselves, but for Christ. We are at our master's disposal. We are, we are then beginning to 
to start a life of being useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work that he puts in front of us. That's the purpose of a Christian's life. And we also are equipped with spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4 explains that God, through his spirit, gives us specific gifts so that we as individuals might build up the church. That's what they're for. Whatever spiritual gift or gifts you might have, God has given that to you, not so that you can just put them under, a, under your, your mattress, but so that you can use them to build up the church and make the church uh, more, a more glorious place. That's what they're for. So we are to live our lives for Christ. We devote our lives like an offering to him so that we might then be refreshing and reviving to people in the church, to people in this room, to people in the community. That's what we're supposed to be about. So the question is, do you move toward people in your life with the intent to bless them? Do you feel like my job is to be blessed, to be a blessing? Do you see need and then want to take action and want to go be refreshing to people? What about your words? Do you encourage others with your words? This is a command. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another. I mean, we are, there is such power in our words. And if we would use them to encourage one another daily, imagine what our church would be like. Imagine, especially in this society that is now so just wrecked with depression and anxiety, if we were an encouraging force in this society, what the church could do. Imagine the witness we would have. So is it, do we have that kind of refreshing and reviving spirit about us, or are we lukewarm? Do we just say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and it has no effect on my life? Does your life look any different from that of an unbeliever? That's what it means to be lukewarm. If you know anything about college football, you know that the 2014 Florida State Seminoles were lukewarm. In 2013, they won a national championship. Famous Jameis. We all know him and love him. Some of us more than others. But uh, they, I don't know if you know this, but every single player on Florida State's roster in 2013 spent time in the NFL. That is impressive. Maybe they're not the greatest college football team of all time, but they were pretty awesome. So then the next year, they they still have Jameis, right? He's still their quarterback, but they lost some key leadership. Timmy Jernigan, Telvin Smith, LaMarcus Joyner, they all all went to the NFL. And these are the guys that were like the glue. They held the team together. They motivated them. They pushed them. So the next year, you got all these talented guys on the roster. But you know what they did? Every single game, they almost lost. It was like they get down by like 20, and Jameis would have to like, mount this crazy comeback, and they pull it out in the end until finally they get to the playoff and Oregon beat them like 150 to 12 or something. like I don't know what it was. It was bad. So what's my point? They had so much talent, guys. I'm telling you, like, they could have, they could have repeated. They could have beaten Urban Meyer and Ohio State, but they, they didn't care. They just didn't care. They were like, Whatever, I'm going to the NFL next year. I don't care about college football. We just won a championship last year. He's like, yeah, but I wanted another one. Okay, okay. Laodicea. What does that have to do with Laodicea? They had, they had the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They had Christ in them, and they, and they just acted like it didn't matter. They acted like, who cares? So Jesus gives them a warning He says, I will spit you out of my mouth. I thought of Jonah when I read this because, you know, Jonah, everybody thinks that he got in the belly of the fish and was all like repentant and changed. But we know later, if you read Jonah 3 and 4, he really wasn't. He was like angry that God was going to be gracious to Nineveh. So like when when Jonah gives his prayer of thanksgiving to God, the next thing you read is that God had the whale spit him out of his mouth. Like, I'm sick of you. Just go do what I said. So that's kind of what I think of here. And, and the point is, is that, look, Jesus is not saying you're going to lose your salvation. Okay? He's not saying that because that's impossible. If we are, if we are believers in Christ, we can't lose that. That would, 
that would be impossible. But what he's saying is that if you're living your life to the point where weeks and months and years go by and, and it doesn't look like there's any kind of fruit, it doesn't look like there's any life change, then just maybe you need to consider the possibility that you've never had salvation in the first place. That's what he's saying. That's the harsh warning that we get here. But we also need to see that he's not saying this is going to happen yet. He's saying, I, I will, or I'm like, I'm about to if you don't change. He's actually giving them grace here. He's saying, yes, you are apathetic and you are indifferent, but I am patient. I am gracious. I am waiting for you to come back to me. So let's, let's talk first, before we talk about what it looks like to come back to Jesus after we've been lukewarm, I want to spend some time talking about why we get lukewarm. How does that happen? And what we see is that we become lukewarm when our love for Jesus is choked out by other things. Verse 17 We'll explain that. He says, for, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. Ouch. 1 Timothy 6.10, uh, I want to look at that too, just to, just to give us a little more context for what's going on here. He says, in, in, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy, for the love of money is a root of of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So this might be one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible because you might have thought your whole life that this, this said that money is the root of all evil, but it's not what it says. It's the love of money. It's important to understand the difference because it's not saying that money's bad. Money isn't bad. Money can be a blessing from God. If you have a lot of money and you use it for his glory, awesome. We need that. But what we don't want is to have this love of money, which in the Greek, um, it also can mean something called avarice, which is one of those big words that I always thought it meant something else, but it's not what I thought it was. So here's what it means. Excessive and insatiable desire for wealth. That's what avarice is. It's when you get something and then immediately, it just doesn't satisfy, and you always want more. It's when you raise your standard of living, and once you do, you're like, okay, not enough. I want more. It's this just, you always want to gain. Maybe you fear that you can't live without money. Maybe if you do lose your money, it crushes you. That's probably a love of money. And it leads, it says, to all kinds of evil. In Laodicea, the evil that this led to was being lukewarm. That's, this is the root cause of why they became lukewarm. Their love of money choked out their love of Jesus so that they then experienced this indifference and apathy about Jesus and all they really cared about was material things. So like, if you think about this, this, the parable of the sower, Jesus is talking about the guy that throws the seeds on the ground and he says, there's one seed that fell in the soil, but then when it grew up, it got choked out by thorns. And he says later in Matthew 13, 22, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is what was going on. Now again, let's, let's keep going deeper. I, I want to keep examining this. Why money? Why is the love of puppies not do this? Why does love of coffee or books not do this? Because it's different somehow. Here's the clue. Money is how we acquire self-sufficiency. This is the real root of it. Money is how we get to avoid being needy. The Laodicean said, I am wealthy and I need nothing. They were boasting about this. They were arrogant about it. Like, I don't need to depend on anybody else. I can buy whatever I need to buy. I got wealth. I got resources. I love that feeling. I love being able to say, I'm the king of my own little kingdom. Do you guys remember the great gas shortage of 2021? It was awesome, right? Lasted like, what, three days? Panic buying everywhere. People filling plastic bins and plastic bags with gas. Like, that's going to be good. 
Why? Why, are, why do people panic buy? Why do we go to Costco, which is basically just acceptable panic buying? I mean, <laughs> I, need, I need 68 rolls of toilet paper because then I'll feel like I don't need anything. Why do we do that? Well, we like to be self-sufficient. We like, we like to avoid the feeling of need. We like to provide for ourselves. We, we like to think, if I got problems, I can throw money at it and they go away like magic. We love that feeling. The problem, it's a huge problem, is that that feeling just masks what's true. And what's true is that we are all needy all the time, whether we realize it or not. We depend on God every second of every day, our entire lives. But money, wealth, can make us blind to this and, in fact, even suppress this knowledge. And we get this mirage of self-sufficiency. Now, I want to be clear. I, in some ways, self-sufficiency is great. Like, all these grads graduating from high school, we want them to be self-sufficient, right? We don't want them living in our, well, I was going to say basement. We don't have basements in Florida. We don't want them living in our bonus room when they're 35, we want them to go out in the world and, and make something of their life and be self-sufficient, right? Start their own family one day if that's what God calls them to. But, so that's good, but what I'm saying is when we start to think that we are spiritually self-sufficient, then we are in the greatest danger of our lives. Because what we're actually saying is on judgment day, I can stand in front of God by myself and say, I don't need any help. That is a lie. Every single one of us needs Jesus Christ to be our advocate, our representative, our mediator. He needs to stand in for us on judgment day so that that's the only way we have eternal life. Is, is if he stands before God the Father and says, don't look at this person's record, look at mine. And his record is perfect. So we need Jesus Christ for salvation. That is our only hope. But, but we don't stop needing him after we're saved. We need him every day. We need him to, just to get through today, we need Jesus. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that apart from Jesus Christ, you can do nothing that is the truth. Are we blind to it? The Laodiceans could not admit it. They lived like they could do whatever they wanted apart from Jesus. They lived like they didn't need Jesus at all. Is that us too? Do we look at our life, look at our words, look at our actions, look at our motivations? Do, do, they, do they paint a picture that we are shaping our lives around Jesus Christ, like he is the central point of our lives? That's what we hope for. Or are our lives painting a picture that we're just trying to squeeze Jesus into them? Like he's a genie. We just rub a lamp when we're really in trouble. But you know what? That's what unbelievers do. When unbelievers have really hard things going on, they pray to God or whatever they think God is. Is that the only time that we pray is when we have something terrible happen? Or do we need him every single day? So he says that, Jesus says the Laodiceans, again, he uses all these very harsh adjectives. You are wretched, pitiable, poor, naked, and blind. But look, this is a wake-up call. This, he's not insulting them. He's not trying to be just mean to them. He's saying, please wake up. I do not want you to remain indifferent and apathetic your whole life. So, so what do we do? If we are this way. If we are indifferent, if you look at your heart and say, yeah, I'm indifferent, I'm apathetic, I have no refreshing and reviving works and speech going on right now, what do we do? Well, there's, there's two things I want to look at. First thing is that we remember that Jesus is superior and everything he offers has eternal value. Verses 18 and 19 say, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. 
Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So Jesus is, is incredible. Like he just used all these things that you would go find in a market in Laodicea to, to make his point of what they need. He's like, he's, he's using these metaphors that they would clearly understand to try to wake them up and see what they really need. And he's, he's basically saying this, Marshall Siegel, uh, he has this quote about what Jesus is saying. He says, you think yourself rich? Let me make you wealthy beyond imagining. That's with the gold refined by fire. You think yourself secure? Let me clothe you in garments of righteousness that will never tear or fade. You think yourself sufficient? Let me show you just how blind you are and how blindness falls like scales before my love. Jesus is offering to us, we're, we're settling, when we want to be self-sufficient, we're settling for the temporary, and he's offering us the eternal. So he's saying, stop looking to yourself, and whatever you think that you can get with your self-sufficient abilities and power, and rely on me, because I am sufficient for you, and, you, and I'm all you need. These are hard words, but they are loving discipline, as he says in verse 19. He's saying, again, I'm not going to let you go on being indifferent and apathetic. I'm going to discipline you, because I love you. Is that what he's doing for us right now? But it's not just discipline. He also pursues us. Verse 20 uh, talks about this. He says in, in 20 through 22, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the second thing we do here, if we're feeling apathetic and indifferent towards Jesus, the second thing we do, we invite him back in to reign and rule over us. He says here that he is knocking on the door. What does that mean? Well, he's knocking on the door of our hearts. We've been, if, if, we, are, if we are lukewarm, we've been in a spiritual coma. We, we've been just blind to everything that's going on in our lives. We've been chasing after this self-sufficiency when all the while we need Jesus. And what we need is a renewal of our relationship with Jesus. The story of the prodigal son, I, I think, is so fitting for so many different scenarios, but, but this one in particular. You know the story, he, the son is loved by his father, but he goes to his father and he asks for his inheritance. And you got to understand that in the ancient world, if you ask for your inheritance before your father had passed, you're telling him, dude, you're dead to me. Because I, I want what I would get if you were dead. And so he gets it. His father gives it to him. And he goes off. And you know the story. He squanders it. And he ends up living with the pigs. He's eating pig food. And at some point, it says that he thinks, what if I went back to my dad's house? I could just be a slave. But at least I'd be eating better than this. So what do, you think, what do you think happened there? Don't you think that was Jesus knocking? Knocking on the door of, oh, man, I want to do it. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Anyway, anyway sorry, I had to. I just couldn't, I couldn't contain myself. Um, he's knocking on the door of his heart. He's, he's pricking his conscience like, hey, wake up. Go back to your father. Go back. And he goes back. And again, he's thinking, I could just be a slave. But what happens? His father runs out to meet him, which in the ancient Near East, old men did not run. If you ran, that was a sign of disrespect. But he doesn't care. He runs to meet his son, throws a robe and a ring on him, and says, kill the fattened calf. My son is home. We're having a feast. Think about this for a second. Do you feel like if you are distant from Jesus that you have got to do things to get back into his good graces? Do you feel like you've got to do a checklist like Jesus isn't going to love you unless you do these certain things? I want you to understand that the Bible is saying that's not true. That if you are loved by Jesus but you are distant from him, he's saying, I'm waiting, I'm ready, whenever you want to let me back in, and it'll be like I never left. 
we'll have a feast. That's what he's saying. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been at Apathetic and indifferent because you've let wealth and self-sufficiency just blind you to your need for Jesus has choked that out. Come back to him. Maybe you've suffered. You've suffered much and and you've kind of grown bitter towards Jesus. Like, how could you let me go through this stuff? You need to see that Jesus has suffered more. And he suffered because, partly because he wanted to identify with us. He wanted to be able to say, yeah, I know. I've been through it. He suffered, and he understands. If there is a great distance between you and Jesus, or me and Jesus, I've been there, and I know, and I know the problem is not Jesus, it's me. So what I need to do is hear him knocking on the door of my heart and let him back in. So what does that look like? What does that look like? We let him back into the throne of, of our hearts. Our hearts are a throne and something is always on it. It needs to be Jesus, but we're usually letting something else be there. We're usually letting something else reign and rule over us. We need to say to Jesus, come back in and be the king of my heart. And that means we're going to have to address the things that choke out our relationship with Jesus. Whatever, if it's money, we address that. We, we be honest about that and we say, maybe, maybe I just need to start giving giving away my money. If it's relationships, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that could be a problem, but maybe you've been trying to control every relationship of your life, and maybe what you need to do is just stop trying to control people and love them for who they are. Maybe it's suffering, like I said, and you felt bitter, and you need to, again, you need to deal with the fact that Jesus has suffered much on our behalf. Ultimately, it's it's always going to be sin, right? There's always going to be sin lurking that's going to force us or try to get us to choke out a relationship with Jesus. And so what do we do? We fill our hearts and minds with God's word. We treat, we treat this, his word like it is food to our souls, because it is. And when we are tempted to sin, we trust his promises in the midst of that. We, we remember that he says there's always a way out, and we take the step of faith to take the way out. And then when we do that, we see, oh yeah, he's true, he's true to his, his promises. He always keeps his promises. And that feeling right there, that experience right there, actually grows us spiritually to the point where next time we remember that. It's like muscle memory. And we're like, oh yeah, I I could sin, but I don't have to because Jesus is better. It it will never, I mean, sin is going to be there until glory, but it, it can be less and less of a hold over us. This is kind of what it looks like, I think, to let Jesus back in to reign and rule over us, to, to reclaim lordship over us. And this is hard. It was hard for the Laodiceans, who are wealthy and self-sufficient. It's hard for West Chaseans, which, face it, we're a lot like them. We're self-sufficient. We, we like to be able to do things ourselves. So the question for us is, can we submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ? Do we, do we understand what that means? That we're literally saying, yeah, Jesus You have authority over everything about me. There's nothing that I will hide from you. And this is what he says. If so, verse 21, he says, you'll reign with me just like I reign with my father. And that's a big claim because Jesus has the whole kingdom of God. Like, it's all his. One day the whole world will be his kingdom. And he's saying, in the future, if you belong to me, you're going to have a share in that. What's mine is yours. Now, we, we said earlier that being self-sufficient is like saying, yeah, I love being the king of my own little kingdom, but Jesus is offering us the kingdom, the whole thing. And it may not feel like it right now, but in the future, in the new heavens and new earth, it's all going to be ours if we belong to him. We get the whole thing. So he's offering that to us. Will we, will we set aside our pursuit of the temporary for the, for the eternal. That's what really we're looking at here. Now, I just want to offer one more word before I close on what that might look like. Because, yeah, that's a future thing. How do we practice that right now? Well, think again about this idea of Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts. How do we model that in our relationships in a way that's refreshing and reviving to people? 
I want you to think about how many people you have in your life you've said, I'm not going to restore my relationship with that person until they come to me and apologize and they own their guilt. They've hurt me. They've done things. And, and we're just going to have this distance until they come back and own up to all of it. I've been there. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. But we need to hear that there's nothing biblical about that. It's actually unbiblical. And if we think that that's like a point of pride or dignity, we, we need to go read the Bible. <laughs> because what Jesus did is say, you've done things to me, you've done all kinds of things to me, but I stand at the door and I knock. I'm waiting and I forgive you. And what if we modeled that to people? What if we said, look, yeah, you've hurt me. We're not, we're not denying that. We can, we can admit that. But I've probably done some things too. I've probably messed up too. And I just want you to know I forgive you. Will you, can we go have lunch? Can we go have coffee? What if we did that to people? Like, could that not be refreshing and reviving to our world? I mean, we probably need it in the church. But imagine if that's the model, the witness that we had to the world, that, that we as Christians have this thing of such great value that we're willing to spend our lives with, with the sole purpose of refreshing and reviving the world around us so that everybody hears about it. Wouldn't that be amazing? Let's pray.